very much. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm just going to make myself comfortable. I'm sure it's going to be hot up here under the lights. So who came to the last retail event that was held here? Just a few hands, a few less hands than before. But there's about a third of the audience that's been to Dublin before, yeah? Um, it's a quick show of hands as well, just for those folks who are working in an agency versus those clients who are working uh, within clients. So people here representing agencies. Okay. That's probably about a quarter or a third of the audience as well. Great. So, uh, yeah, a bit of background on myself. Uh, as Tobias said, I've, I work in the retail team here in the UK. Here in the UK. Well, obviously we're in Dublin, but in the UK. Uh, and I head up the, uh, the, the pure play sector. I've worked at, uh, at Google for 10 years. And, yeah, I did sell my first online ad. It was before there were even any IAB ad formats. So you can imagine that was quite a while ago. And I appreciate a lot of the audience here was at school. I don't want to give my, my, my age away too much, but I was a, a workable age at that age. So... Um, so let me just find the clicker. What are we going to do today? So um, I guess the headline really is, is that we're here, you know, Googlers, all of us here, to help you get the most out of the web. We want you to leave here energized, recharged, and with ideas that you can take back into your companies, into your agencies about how you can help your clients or help yourself to get the most out of the web. Um, we use the term change champions, and uh, the event that we did here before was... Uh, for our C-level audience in the retail space. Now, I, I spend a lot of time with, within companies, um, at both a senior level and at a more junior level. And I think that what I know is that whilst we can drive the agenda um, at the very top of organizations, it's very much um, people who are doing the heavy lifting within organizations who actually make those changes happen. And I think it's really important that we can give you and arm you with information that you can take back into your organizations to enable you to become the change champions within your organization. So today, I want to talk about uh, today's connected consumer in an e-commerce world. As I say, I'm going to touch upon many of the areas that we're going to cover in the next 24 hours or so. Um, but I'm also looking forward to spending some time with you tonight. I think most of the value of these events uh, comes from meeting your account managers, uh, mixing with other, other uh, competitors maybe, or people from other markets, uh, networking and learning from one another as well. So uh, if you can't ask questions at the end of this session, hopefully we can take uh, sessions over a beer or so tonight, and I'll be at the, the house as well. So there's three elements of the future um, and how they're related to the, the sort of connected consumer that I would like to take you through today. The first one is, the first kind of pillar is technology, the second one is consumers, and then the third one is business. So they're quite generic titles, but within there we'll, we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper um, as to what's happening within each of them. So within technology, you know, technology is changing the world fast. And technology itself is changing really, really fast. We're going to look at how everything is connected to everything, increasingly more so. Secondly, we're going to look at how technology is starting to get out of the way. And then thirdly, we'll look at things like data, how that helps us with our knowledge, and how that helps us with insight. So consider this picture. I think many of you may have seen the picture before, but I think it's such a powerful image. It shows uh, 2005 Pope Benedict and then uh, 2013, slightly different circumstances the pictures were taken in, but clearly there's a, a lot more devices in the second picture than there are in the first picture. When we think there's 2.8 billion people now online in the world, 2.8 billion people, almost 3 billion people online, that's you know, through a variety of devices, and we think there's probably about 10 billion internet-connected devices currently around, around the globe. Now, by 2020, projections are that pretty much everybody on the planet will be online. 8 billion people will be online. Um, and there'll be something like 50 billion devices out there. Huge, huge numbers. Um, and when we think about even the platforms that we've got, Chrome, Chrome, 750 million people now are using Chrome around the globe on different devices, on tablets, on desktops, and on mobile phones. And Android, over a billion installed devices, uh, devices that are turned on. So one of the things I always like to find out, I've got quite a lot of internet-connected devices. I collect a lot of gadgets at home. But I would like to see just who's got the most gadgets amongst them. So um, I'm going to count up to, I'll go, I'll go as far as 10. Um, as I count up through the numbers, lower your hand. So um, raise your hand. Who's got one device? Two devices they have at home. Three, four, five, six, seven, 
There's someone there at the back. Seven devices. Well, I'll have a beer with you tonight, and I'll find out exactly what those are. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, you, you can see that our homes are, are growing all the time with different devices within them. And actually, um, Deloitte uh, talk about this as a sort of scatter cushion effect. They say that on your sofa, in effect, you have... For every cushion you've got, there's, a, there's a, a proxy that you have one connected device sat next to you. So if you've got five cushions like my wife likes to have across all of our cushions, we generally have five different devices there as well. And then, you know, mobile phones, we're kind of, we're using them about 150 times a day to kind of refer to them. I suspect during the course of this presentation, you'll each look at your phone about 10 times. I'll try and keep that as low as I possibly can, but it will be about 10 times. And throughout the, the next 24 hours, 150 times. And then a third of our queries are now on mobile as well, generally, across the globe. A third of our queries happening on mobile. But it's not just phones. You know, those lucky 20 of you amongst you are going to try out Google Glass. Um, you know, Amazon, two weeks ago, launched a wearable store. So they now have curated for you um, watches, cameras, um, various other devices that you can buy around fitness, wellness, healthcare, watches. I have one of the Jawbone Ups. Anyone wearing a jawbone up? Yep. So there's a program going on now for the, the latest up that allows you uh, to all join together. And those people who drink coffee at a certain time of day, it can then see your rest patterns throughout the rest of the day and how late you drink coffee. I think it's just amazing. You think millions of people connecting these, wearing these devices and then understanding how people are sleeping at night time. And then another statistic which just blew me away, connected cars. So some cars have got things like heads-up displays now within them. Some have got, within the dashboard, the ability to connect your phone directly to them. They may even be able to send the command from your mobile phone or your desktop directly to your car. The value of that market is currently worth 40 billion, and it's grown eight times in the last three years. So it's eight-fold increase in the last three years. So connected cars are perhaps some of the, ne the next sort of devices that we'll see connected. And all of this rises and gives rise to lots of different data, lots of different inputs, which makes our jobs even more and more complex. We're getting towards uh, an internet of things. So in the top right, Philips uh, had a friend over recently and his fiance for a drink, and he was able to turn on the lights of his house. So when he got home, he could make sure that he had a red light above his front door. Why he'd want to do that, I don't know, but there's the ability to do that. Um, we acquired Nest, uh, a very large acquisition, um, ability to learn about the temperatures that you like in the house. We've got smoke detectors and also thermostats as well. Adidas is starting to build um, textiles now, and the textiles have actually got microfibers that sort of knitted in there that actually can work with the transceivers and the responders within the devices they've got. And then there's also the talk of drones and the commercial applications of what drones can do. So everything is starting to get more connected to everything else. But it creates huge amounts of complexity. Um, Astro Teller, who heads up our Google X program, which is where many of our products like uh, self-driving you know, self cars and Google Glass came from, he was speaking at Disrupt, which is a tech crunch event last week. And he said that technology can be used to get technology out of the way. And he gave a really simple example. So I expect most people here either drive or have driven a car. Yeah? Now, I've got an old car from the 60s, and my old car doesn't have anti-lock brakes. But all modern cars and motorbikes have anti-lock brakes. Now, it's a simple application of technology getting out of the way. Technology, 5, 10, 15 years ago, was advanced enough to be able to create anti-lock brakes for cars. Now, for us, excuse me, for us as consumers, we good? <laughs> for us as consumers, it means nothing to us. You know, we, 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 we expect to get in the car stamp on the brakes and the car stop. But the ability of manufacturers to make that technology such that the cars don't skid at the same time is a phenomenal achievement. And it's a great example of technology sort of getting out of the way and allowing us to uh, do what we want to do as quickly as we want to do. Now, we've got things like data overload. We're generating so much data now, CRM, about customers' interactions, things like web analytics. Um, and I believe that in the future we'll start to find, such as with technologies like Google Now, where we're absolutely using data to anticipate the environments within which we'll be, we'll be interacting. So when we think about the data that's out there, let's think about the size of the planet. It's got 39% of the global population of the planet is pretty much online right now, almost 3 billion of the eight. Now, advertising as, a, as an industry worldwide, 
$565 billion gets spent every year trying to target people. It's a huge, huge number. In fact, in Western Europe, where most of us are from, $115 billion gets spent. You know, the market in Germany, $24 billion, $25 billion. The market in the UK, $20 billion. They're huge, huge, staggering numbers. And in fact, you know, the more effective and qualified the prospects are, the more efficient your spend is going to be in reaching those people. And that's the kind of nirvana, the promised land that we're trying to aim for with the data that we've got. When we think about consumption and how we spend our time, UK statistics, I'm sure they're similar for uh, much of the European market I looked at as well, we now spend four hours per day on digital media. So we're not, we're not challenging TV here, but we're just saying that our consumer habits, in part because of the number of mobile devices, is becoming a lot more on digital media each day. And because we spend so much time on digital media, when we're there, so TV is about three and a quarter hours in the UK, we spend about four hours a day on digital media across different devices. And when we're on those digital media, we're looking at different sites. We're using search. We're going to uh, the Google Display Network. We're looking at different sites that are out there. We're looking at content. We're going to retailers' sites. Um, we're going to news sites. We're going to all variety of sites. And at the time, we're also leaving lots of different signals about what, what we like, where we like to spend our time, um, the things that we like to curate, the things that we like to put into our shopping baskets. And we know, you know with data and with insight, you know, we can drive more actions from consumers we want to interact with ourselves. So audience signals, like those that, that consumers leave across the web, are critical for us understanding. They're, in effect, like the new keywords for how we can interact with people. And it gives us a greater power of prediction. So things like dynamic ads, being able to serve the right ad to the right person in the right context is becoming ever more powerful. And we can collect both offline and online signals as well. So using things like CRM, in-store interactions, if we're capturing the data. Um, and we're going to learn a lot more about this uh, from Jeanette in audience session this afternoon. Um, and then furthermore, we can also do things like segment that data and really understand more clearly about what the most exciting prospects are, what the most likely are in terms of those to uh, engage with ourselves. And of course, this is all part of a process which is embedded around measurement uh, and testing to make sure that what we're trying to do in terms of reaching those customers is most powerful. So the second pillar I wanted to explore, first one, technology. Second one is just around consumers. Um, so all this technology change is creating a, a kind of new consumer. We're still the same people as yesterday, but we're actually a new consumer because we've got new tools at our disposal. And you know, tech has changed our expectations. Technology has changed our expectations about what we can get, how we can get it, and how soon we can get it. I often sit there thinking about things I might need to get for the house, but if I can't order it and know that it's going to be shipped within the next 24 hours, I get really frustrated. And so we're going to talk through sort of two or three different areas here. Instant gratification, things like infinite choice, and uh, a personalized experience. And Tim Berners-Lee called the World Wide Web, you know, WWW. Now, in actual fact, the reality of it is it's more like what we want, where we want it, you know, and when we want it. So these key themes uh, are critical for consumers. Now, familiar household scene, um, sitting around, media meshing, uh, perhaps watching a TV program, playing with an app, voting on it, um, perhaps media stacking, doing a separate task while watching TV in the background. We're expecting those answers right away, and we're putting orders in online through e-commerce, and we're expecting to get you know, instant gratification. We think about these examples. So Argos is a UK retailer. 20% of all of their sales in Q4 of last year, the 18 weeks just leading up to and after Christmas, 20% came through on mobile devices. Uh, if we think about Amazon, they just painted it in the new year, an ability to have, I think it's called anticipatory shipping. So this is actually pushing the product as close to the consumer even before they've ordered it. So recommendation-wise, they already know what you're likely to purchase, and we'll learn later on that actually a high proportion of their of their purchases come through recommendations. And then this is Volvo in the Swedish market have done some experimentation around their cars and being able to use cars as lockers. So they're actually, if you give to an e-commerce partner the ability to deliver a product, when they come to within a certain proximity of your car, a few meters, it opens up and they can then put that item 
immediately in the back of your car so you can drive at home. It saves you having to go to the local train station or you know, you, you not be delivered at your house because the parcel's too big. And this stuff's real, it's going to start happening. And then this was uh, Zucao. So prior to the, the Amazon announcement, which kind of came around Black Friday in November uh, in the US, this was actually an announcement in Sydney. It was an Australian company. And what they were trying to achieve here was doing textbook rentals. So this was middle of last year. And they realized that lots of students around that Sydney area couldn't afford the books, but they knew that they could get the books from A to B because they were quite small using quad quadcopters. So we're going to start seeing more of this stuff happening as well. And it's because people want to get hold of stuff so quickly and the technology can allow it. And when we think about how we, I'm just going to connect my phone here, how we uh, you know, think about purchasing. Yes, we purchase across different devices, but we also research as well. It isn't just all about purchasing. Um, and I think that mobile phones are likely to be um, some of the most powerful personal sort of digital assistants that will help guide us in the future around uh, the physical retail store. Now, we can see here that people have photographed stuff. I personally have bought a Wii, but at the same time checked for my, you know, for my own sanity that I could, that was the best possible price and best availability of where I could get it from. Now, if we switch to here, I'm going to do a quick demo. So this is just There we go. There's my children. So um, this is an in-store. This is a, a, a baby care company in the UK. It's uh, predominantly pure play, but I think it also uh, has some now um, physical retail stores as well. So I'm just going to do a search. Kiddie Care, Peterborough. Here is Kiddie Care. So just looking at the results here, looking at a map. Uh, directions of how to get there embedded directly within there. But if I click on the map and go through to the icon, it should immediately launch a uh, closer map, full screen map of exactly where it is with the reviews there that I can see beneath. Within the reviews, we've got street view I can see outside. I can go back out of there. And maybe um, what's of interest here is actually sort of looking within the store itself. So I may be in a rush. I may have two or three children on my hands. But I've got the ability to be able to understand exactly where within that store I can get to um, if I wanted to uh, you know, shop. And there's, there's numerous examples of this technology working. We've worked with many, many partners, including people like IKEA as well, across Europe. Um, so 4G just allows us to get faster. We can switch back out of it now. Um, allows us to be more researched, and we can uh, be more informed when we get to uh, stores to check online. And now back to the theme about how Google can help. You know, we want to help you, customers, advertisers, and, and agencies who represent them to, to help you know, win those moments that matter from those consumers when they're on those different devices, whether it's tablet, whether it's mobile or desktop. And we think that you should be there on all devices and that you should be relevant in terms of the ad formats that you're using, whether it's mobile, first messaging, whether it's the formats themselves, or whether it's contextual bidding based upon the location that someone might be. And then finally, we think that you should be optimizing as well, that you should be measuring all of those conversions, all those conversions that are happening in retail stores, whether they come via traditional means, whether they're happening via cross-device, starting a transaction at home, or whether they're going via phone call, or perhaps mobile, mobile to store as well in terms of um, searching for a store and finding out about it. There's one example here. I just want to show you a quick video. So Neil's going to be coming up after me and taking us through in a lot more depth about how you can win in the multi-screen world. But I've got one example here from Adidas. Now, Adidas worked with iProspect in North America to understand the value of people searching for the store. Now, if you can just play the video here, please. Adidas has always felt like mobile is the right thing to do. It's a, the right place for us to be. It's really the ability to connect the investment to the return. My name is Nicole Mills. I'm the Senior Digital Marketing Manager for e-commerce at Adidas America. My name is Carrie Smith, and I am the Director of Mobility at iProspect, based here in New York City. When it comes to measuring mobile, if we were to look at a one-to-one -one response or a one-to-one -one measurement of what our media budget is driving on our mobile site, we're missing a big part of that picture. As performance marketers, a lot of the time we look at direct response. 
And what mobile is requiring us to do is redefine direct response. We're just noticing that a lot of people were finding stores using their device. So the central goals were for Adidas and I prospects to sort of come together and figure out a methodology to measure consumers on mobile devices coming into retail and purchasing products. When we worked with Adidas to figure out what this equation should be, we used a lot of their internal data. We were able to then apply that one in every five store locator clicks would result in a visit to a store. Based on that, we knew 13% of in-store visits would result in a purchase, and that average order value in-store was about $71. Because we knew that, that one person out of five every store locator clicks would actually go in a store, it indicated a higher level of intent. So we applied a 20% conversion rate with an average order value of $80. After we ran a couple of tests, we were able to identify that every store locator click was then worth $3.20 for the brand. Once we applied this equation, we found a 680% incremental lift in ROI. Before, all we would be able to track was if someone made a conversion in the e-commerce channel. After this case study, we now can apply some of these assumptions to then net a positive ROI. At Adidas, it was like, aha, we can play in this space. I love it. It's just a really, really simple but powerful example. And tomorrow we're going to hear from uh, David and Rob about attribution, about Ropo, and also you know, re research online, purchase offline, um, and also um, about uh, pure play companies as well and how they can take advantage of mobile. So the second area within consumers that we're expecting. So we're expecting the first area is instant gratification. The second area is infinite choice, staples. Great example, North America. So they actually reduced in their store 25% of the SKUs that they were stocking. So big implications for a retailer because they can reduce their store footprint, perhaps use different areas of the store for different reasons. But 25%, all of their stores, they slashed the inventory. At the same time, they added 100,000 SKUs, 100,000 SKUs to their total inventory. Now, with the space that they created in stores, what they'd put within there was kiosks. So now they've got the ability of people still going in stores, looking for most of the items that they've always had, their biggest sellers, but the smaller items perhaps that don't sell so frequently, they now have a kiosk where people can transact immediately and have that item shipped to themselves. This is a great example. Now, it's a video, I'm going to play it in a second, but there's actually, and it's a, it's a great video, it's, a, it's, it's really funny, but I think one of the things to bear in mind is that it's a, it's a strategic decisions sort of underlying why they chose to choose a video like this and make a video like this. It was actually made by an agency in North America called Draft FCB, um, and it, it went out last year. It actually got, in 48 hours, 2 million YouTube views. Has anyone seen this before? A yeah. couple of people, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so just a great example of where you know, people can still win the moments that matter. This is a company, Kmart, that was struggling with the likes of uh, Amazon and Walmart, who were you know, taking pieces out of them in terms of uh, the competition and the size at which they were um, selling volume and uh, inventory that they've got. But if we can play the video here, it'll explain itself. Ship my pants. Right here. Ship my pants, you're kidding. You can ship your pants right here. You hear that? I can ship my pants for free. Wow. I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. I just ship my pants and it's very convenient. Very convenient. I just ship my drawers. I just ship my nighty. I just shipped my bed. <laughs> you can't find what you're looking for in store? We'll find it at Kmart.com right now and ship it to you for free. Great ad, yeah? Great ad. So uh, we're going to hear from Peter. Um, later on today about winning performance and about how through branding we can now tell stories that perhaps traditionally wouldn't have been told on TV. So uh, a great example. And of course, obviously, as a result of stories like that, there's interactions, there's cookies, there's abilities to retarget people as well. Now, another thing that I'm sure is close to many of your hearts is just feeds. They're not the most beautiful thing in the world, but they actually do a really, really important job, particularly with uh, Google PLAs um, and also shopping as well. So. No, the error rate is absolutely 100% one critical thing that many companies need to fix. Getting it right is going to be critical for your business. And providing all of your products in their totality is just another example of the kind of infinite choice 
that you're uh, trying to offer through feeds to all of your consumers or potential customers that might be out there. And you know, off the back of that, we're going to hear um, uh, also about PLAs tomorrow. So we've got Wolfgang and Nisha who'll be here tomorrow morning. But um, what we want to do is make sure that Everyone who's you know, using uh, kind of PLAs currently is taking full advantage of the shopping campaigns that we're migrating people through to right now. Um, there's massive insights that you can achieve by using it. The management of it is far easier. Your shopping campaign is far easier uh, from a reporting perspective, and there's also impression share and benchmarking data that's available within there. So we're going to hear more about uh, product listing ads tomorrow. And it's a truly retail-centric solution that we're offering uh, and have assembled for our customers in this space. Now. Personalization is the, the final thing that I want to touch upon just within consumer and what's so important to consumers. Now, personalized recommendations, 35% of Amazon's sales happen through recommendations. So as soon as you log in, the first thing, or even before you log in, the first thing it asks you to do is log in so you can see what you want to get. It's frustrating, I know, if your partner's been shopping on your login, so you often get the wrong recommendations. But um, I've already talked about an anticipatory shipping, you know, trying to get items as close to consumers so they can be, deli be delivered very, very quickly. But in, let's reflect backwards. In 2005, only 11% of the population actually had the faith to make a transaction online. People just didn't trust online as a channel through which they can make sales. Yet the expectation now is that 75% of consumers expect all sites to have a personalized shopping experience when you arrive there. So there's a great example here of a kind of personalized view. So who's got Google Now on their phones? Yeah. So look, you can put it on any device. doesn't matter which operating system. I encourage you all to download it. This was me yesterday morning, sat in traffic, driving to the airport. Um, you can see here, it thinks I'm actually on a train, but I was driving at the time. But it says, the transportation mode that you selected will not, will not let you arrive on time. So at this, at this precise time, it thought that I was going to be late for my, for my plane. But just amazing that this technology knew from my diary and my calendar that I had a flight yesterday morning coming in here. It also knew that I had to check into this hotel. Uh, one of my colleagues had a birthday. Um, one of my Dutch colleagues, and that the weather, not just in where I was based in London, but also the weather that was going to be like in Dublin, as well as also, you can see here, I'm a Chelsea supporter, so that had the previous day's Chelsea and Cardiff result as well. So um, just a great example of technology uh, kind of getting out of the way, really, and working very simply and being personalized for ourselves. The other thing we can think about uh, that we're seeing innovation from companies, it's a company called Sparza.com. They actually have provided uh, a technology that allows their retailers, they work with Quicksilver. Um, it works as an you know, in-store solution, and it allows people to actually add to shopping baskets um, items they may want to purchase. Um, but it's also personalized, and it's dynamic as well. So when you walk back into that store, it will know to actually start offering to certain people uh, products that they may well have browsed before or products they may well be interested in. The reality of it is that the margin that retailers can get for their products can be far greater than simply discounting in a blanket way because they know the, the actions that people have taken across those products before. So we're starting to see personalization even down to the storefront as well. Now, the final pillar that I wanted to just explore and touch upon is, is business. And this is business from the perspective of the companies that you work for or the agencies that you represent and the clients that you look after. But it's also business in terms of what your contribution is. And we talked about change champions earlier. I think it's really important that you you need to know about what it is that you can try and drive within your business. You're all leaders in your own right around how you can drive um, uh, leadership in the area, digital leadership in, within your businesses. So we're going to touch on three areas here. Firstly, innovation. Secondly, around omnichannel. We've touched on one or two of those areas before. And then the third area will be around borderless internet. So let's look at these business models. So I'm sure we're familiar with a lot of these. Spotify for music. We've got Kickstarter for funding. We've got Square for payments. Uber for taxis, but Airbnb. And what's fascinating about each of these companies is that they're all less than five years old. Absolutely tremendous when you think about how quickly those companies have come. And some of these companies have got valuations of tens of billions of, of dollars. Huge, huge companies. So innovation is changing absolutely everything. And the pace of change is just getting faster and faster. As I said, none of these existed five years ago. And when we think about innovation at Google, as I said, you'll be looking at Google Glass tomorrow. We, we tend to think of 
uh, with our Google X team, which is a team based out in California, we, we tend to think of it as our moonshot factory, and they're very much world-changing ideas. We, we tend to take really audacious goals, things that can't necessarily be achieved, but we know by trying to achieve them, we might get 30% you know, of the way there, but if the, if the goal is so big in the first place, getting 30% of the way, way there is far better than getting nowhere at all if we're not even prepared to tackle it. So we have some great learnings along the way, and we often know within these areas we're unlikely to make money for many, many years. And I think that it's important when we see and look around the world at retail companies to think about the kind of innovations that companies are making as well and to make sure that you within your businesses are helping to lead that. So omnichannel retailing is the second area that we wanted to look at. Um, and it's the second area of business that's evolving as well. We've organized ourselves within our team sometimes to look after just pure play advertisers or companies that are more multi-channel focused or omnichannel focused. And I think that there's, there's becoming less and less distinction between those channels as we move on. Um, so if you think about going back to 1996 when I sold my first advert, literally nothing was sold online. By 2000, it was a dot-com era, and we all talked about e-commerce. By the last 10 years, we're talking about multi-channel, the ability to buy through different channels, but they were all silos. The data wasn't connected. You could put something into your basket uh, on your desktop. It wouldn't transfer to your mobile phone. You could go in-store. You could log into a kiosk. You wouldn't be able to see it. Now, the reality is those retailers have got it right are starting to make omnichannel retailing really pay off for themselves and their businesses. A couple of statistics here. More than a third of people who start online purchase in store. It's tremendous, isn't it? A third of people who start online purchase in store. And then two thirds of people who shop online do so across multiple devices. So it's absolutely critical that when we think about the customer journey that we've got that tracked all the way through. And Macy's, so this is uh, using a technology called Shopkick, working with uh, the Bluetooth technology and the IB te technology. It allows people to save to their basket when they're offline particular items they might want to want, might want to purchase. They could be favorite items. But when they walk into a store, this is live in North America. And there's a couple of other examples that are working with both um, the Apple store themselves, also Safeway and American Eagle, as grocers are doing this with uh, couponing. But we, we're seeing the technologies that are already embedded, embedded within phones, Bluetooth, low energy technologies, being able to offer people specific um, coupons or vouchers or discounts based upon what they've purchased previously, the geo of where they're based, all creating more uh, data points where you might want to um, target them. And this is a, a Dutch example. My Dutch isn't good. I know there's some Dutch people in the audience, but this is uh, translated into nine streets. It's a, an area of Amsterdam where they actually have nine streets that intersect with each area. It's quite a boutique area. I think a lot of the shops there work together. Now, what they've done is create an app amongst all of those shops. Um, and that app actually has, uh, in addition to some interactivity through QR codes, it means that all of these shops, irrespective of the time of day, whether they're open or closed, people can purchase from those shops. And not only can they can purchase from those shops, but they can also get all of their items delivered at the same time, wrapped up and bundled in the same sort of paper that would come from uh, any of those shops in that kind of area. So we're seeing companies work in different ways and, and thinking more interactively about how they can attract people. And there's all these signals. I talked about signals earlier. When we think about how we engage with consumers and how businesses are working with consumers, whether it's the Kmart example from earlier, whether it's on a mobile phone, or whether it's on social media. We know that businesses are looking at people who have followed them, people who have watched their content, people who have visited their site, people who have subscribed to their newsletters, um, people who have clicked on particular offers or even searched within their sites. And these are all opportunities um, to have more meaningful conversations with those consumers who have interacted with you means far, you can be far faster and have, greater waste, uh, have less wastage um, and, and build far stronger two-way communication as a result of having that. So the final couple of examples I just wanted to, to leave you to, with before we go on to the, the last topic was just um, the experience that you have across all channels. Now, I chose Burberry because Burberry, I know, is an international company that has presence in pretty much every country around the, around the globe. Now, they talk about um, not omni-channel retailing but omniescent channels. And this is... I looked up the description for omniescent, and omniescent is having complete or unlimited knowledge or awareness of understanding of consumers. And that's surely where we're trying to get to, is to have a more complete picture about all those different in digital interactions that you can have. They're blurring the lines of digital and physical worlds. They're atoms and bytes that are being melded together. The ability to go in store and interact with kiosks and actually have um, 
uh, lists that you've created yourselves of products that you might want to purchase or £20,000 raincoats that you can customise for yourself. And we're going to hear a little bit from uh, Yankos as well the next day or so um, about co-marketing strategies, actually this afternoon, about how you can um, work with brands that you may well be representing within your own stores if you've got a retail store. I'm going to play one video. Now, this, before we play this video, this was a, a campaign that ran last year. Um, used about four or five underlying technologies in addition to advertising, display advertising. They used uh, mobile ads. I think they also used uh, light boxes and rich media across DoubleClick. And they also used a few of our geo APIs. So they actually had reflections from Street View. But there was ability through the storefront to be able to send kisses to anyone around the globe. So it had a social mechanic associated to that, and that could be sent via Google+, Facebook, or Twitter. So if we play this video... <laughs> The final topic I want to touch on is borderless internet. So I want to see a quick show of hands for those people who ship items internationally. Okay. So um, and keep your hands raised if you have websites that you translate into different languages as well. Yeah. So you know, it's a huge, huge opportunity. Um, we've done a piece of research with OC and C. Actually, brought a copy of it here with me. Actually, just the uh, the lightened version. Um, the global retail empire. Um, we actually looked at the six largest e-commerce markets um, in the Western world. They are USA, UK, Germany, Nordics, um, France, and the Netherlands. So the total value of the e international e-commerce volumes here, 25 billion in 2013, 25 billion. Now, the annual growth rate is around 30%, the growth that's expected from this. And we reckon by 2020, 130 billion of the value. So there's a five-fold increase. When we think about the online searches, so a lot of the data that they did and analysis they did was based upon our raw data, looking at company names that people are searching for in different domains. So online searches for retailers have grown 50% since 2011. Online searches for retailers has grown 50% since 2011. And 47, 42% of searches are now coming from abroad for typical retail brands. Um, great example that illustrates this point really, really well. I haven't purchased enough from them. My wife has a few times, but Zalando. So everyone knows Zalando, yeah? Show of hands, Zalando. Do we all know them? So uh, just doing a bit of research on them recently. They, they, let's just remind ourselves. They're founded in 2008. This is a business that's six years old, 2008 in Germany. It sells shoes, clothing online in 14 European markets. They expanded into seven new markets in 2012 alone. So prior to that date, you know, seven markets, the further seven markets. Um, by most people's reckonings, they're the fastest EU company to reach one billion in net annual sales. Fastest EU company. About 50% of their overall sales came from Germany about a year ago. Um, and they broke even in Q1 2013 in Germany. Now, the, the recent quarterly results for Q1 of this year, the group revenues for Q1 were 501 million euros, 501. That's a, that's a 2 billion euro run rate for this year. And that grew 35% year on year. Just absolutely staggering numbers when you think about um, what they're doing. And of course, what they've left in their, in their trail is, is many other traditional retailers, perhaps in, in these local markets, who haven't been able to stay as fast and keep up with them. Ben, yeah. Here, what do the lines represent or illustrate? They illustrate um, the 
the point at which they were founded, the businesses, and I believe that it's actually revenues from each of those markets. Yeah. I'll come back to you. It may well be search queries. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so the other final sort of thing of note, really, uh, within this report is just the size of other markets. So, you know, we're quite insular sometimes just looking at our own markets. We should think about the Asian market. 808 billion uh, in terms of e-commerce value, international e-commerce value that they're going to generate. And China, 457 billion. It's growing at 34% year on year. So be mindful of other, competition, you know, other competitors in other markets that we perhaps don't even know about yet. One other big announcement that came out last, last week as well was the IPO for Alibaba. Anyone had a chance to read through it? No? So just the headlines on it. Um, they're formed of three main sites, Taobao, Tmall, and Alibaba. They've got a gross uh, merchandise value um, in terms of items that they sold last year, 248 billion. So to put that in perspective, it's the size of eBay, Amazon, and PayPal, and two or three other companies at the same time. Um, another statistic which just blew me, as well, blew me away as well, they shipped five billion packages last year. Five billion packages. And to put that in the context of UPS, UPS shipped 4.3 billion packages. So they're bigger than UPS in terms of the items that they ship. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is that there's other companies out there that we should kind of be, be mindful of and look at as well to learn from. So in summary for myself, we've looked at three pillars. Just to remind ourselves, we're going to dip into a lot more of these in, in detail over the next uh, 24 hours. But we've looked at technology. We've looked at things like device proliferation, seamless integration, and things like audience signals that we can create as a result of all the different data, knowledge, and insight. We've looked at consumers. We've looked at their multi-screen behavior. And we've touched upon shopping, infinite aisles, infinite choice, endless aisles, and about getting your feed right. And we've also looked at personalized experience, about making that more social for people. And then finally, we've looked at business, about leadership and what you do, and how you can take back some of these ideas into your business, and about how you can brand using digital, whether it's the Kmart example, whether it's a Burberry example. And then finally, we've just touched upon export opportunities and how important export is and where you, never, where you never know your next competitor may well be coming from. So with that, it's all from me, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. Um, so I think I've got three minutes left. Time for one or two questions, if there are any. Is the Android around anywhere? Ah, there we go. Better not kick this. Any questions? Was it all straightforward? There's a question there. No? Is there a hashtag for the event? Is there a hashtag? There is no hashtag. I'm afraid not. Innovate is a great one. <laughs> we could do. Yeah. We could do that. Google at retail. Retail at Google. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Great. We have, um, we might have, like, the audience is a bit, you know, I think they're saturated with this great wealth of information that you're giving them. So I'm just going to give them a second to, uh, to reiterate and rethink what they, what they just heard while I ask you uh, one question. Because I was, doing, I was doing a little bit of math in my, in my notepad while, uh, while James was telling us all of these, all of these interesting facts. And one of, one of the things that I thought, okay, let's imagine that there's only three screens. And I think you put about seven, eight, or nine audience signals up there. So let's take seven, seven audience signals. And then every one of your stores has a variety of different experience. Let's say four. That puts us maybe five. That puts us at about 100 different kinds of iterations, just mathematically, that we want to be considering. Yep. Right? And then we're not even taking into account all of the hundreds of thousands of users that are visiting your site. So just a question to you, when we look at that complexity, yeah. look at the world now and look at the world that you've yeah. drawn for us. How fast are we, how fast is the world moving into this complex state? Yeah. And how fast are we, as yeah. companies, following the world where it's yeah. going? I think companies are moving more slowly than change is happening. Okay. Consumers are leading what's happening. And I think if companies need to think long and hard about how they can scale, and the agencies they're working with long and hard about how they can scale to take advantage of the opportunities, particularly around mobile, because of geos, devices, locations, and context. 
And actually managing that at scale, particularly for retailers, is going to become incredibly complex. Um, so I think it's, the time is really now to get prepared for those sort of changes that are happening. Cool. Thank you very Great. much. In the meantime, because we still have some time, did anyone think of one question that they want to ask James at this moment? It's your last chance before you meet him over a pint of business. There we go. I'm dying to throw this. I'm tempted to kick it. <laughs> there we go. Hi. Hi. Uh, what, one experience that I have working in an agency is how important data are in uh, digital advertising uh, compared to what is the more traditional, let's call advertising like TV and press. But considering the multiple challenges that digital is posing already uh, to uh, digital advertisers, and it seems like there is going to be more and more and more coming, are we maybe going to see a different approach to digital advertising compared to the ones that we have now? So now we are performance driven, data driven, we can tell, we could <laughs> tell to our uh, clients exactly what they were getting per every click. Yeah. That, you know, and every interaction. We are now going to maybe see a situation where we can't, or at least there's going to be a leap of faith that there wasn't there before, like there is maybe in TV or press. Yeah. And how, I think from an agency point of view, we might find that difficult, and I wonder whether... Uh, you know, Google is taking that into consideration and maybe changing perspective of yeah. digital advertising. Yeah, uh, I mean, there is, I think the biggest, the biggest well, irrespective of, of whether you work directly with Google or whether you work through an agency, I think um, the biggest thing that probably incites people to move quickly is just leadership and the leadership that certain companies take. And when you start to get hurt by losing market share or sales to other companies, I think it, it really rallies people to think about what they need to do. Um, but undoubtedly, yeah, data and the, the points of data are going to be growing. And I think that it's important that with security and privacy that um, you know, we're sharing as much as we possibly can between parties to make sure that we can make the right decisions. And it really is about making the right decisions based upon that data. But it's not getting any easier, <laughs> that's for sure. Right. Great. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. James.